Welcome to Always Take Notes. Please join us at Hatchard's Piccadilly in London on October the 25th for a live recording of Always Take Notes. We'll be speaking to Nicholas Shakespeare, who has just published a biography of Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond. His other books include Snow Leg, The Dancer Upstairs, Priscilla and Six Minutes in May. You can buy tickets via the link in the show notes. We hope to see you there. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Rachel and myself spoke with Sarah Braybrook, the publishing director at Ithaca Press. We spoke to Sarah about her entry into publishing, about working at Scribe, an independent in Australia and Britain, and about setting up a new list at Bonnier Books. It's a great episode and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Sarah, to Always Take Notes. It's fantastic to have you on the show. This is sort of a special episode for us because Sarah is the editor of the Always Take Notes book, which came out on October 12th. Um, So I guess we'll start with that. Why did you like our proposal? (laughs) I loved it. I I think it just was a really obvious book that I would want to publish. Um, And it, it just is a very celebratory book and a useful book, um, a sort of mix of, um, you know, wisdom and, you know, very, very deep thoughts and meaningful advice, um, but also a lot of things that really made me laugh and that I found very touching. Um, I think sometimes there is this process by which as people go from being kind of people who are writing you know, basically unpublished to being you know published authors we we sort of miss you create this sort of mystique around them um, and we start seeing them very differently and I think this book completely deconstructs that and really takes it back to um, the very human feelings and you know problems and and you know triumphs really that that one goes through in the course of being published and I really like that I think. And for the the tiny fraction of our listenership who has not already bought one or possibly multiple copies <laughs> of the book, could you um, could you explain to them a little bit like what it offers and what it includes? So it's called Always Take Notes: Advice from Some of the World's Greatest Writers, um, and it's really a uh, sort of compendium of some of the most interesting and useful and fascinating bits of advice that you've collected over five years of very in depth interviews. Uh, with many, many, many of these leading authors. And I think it's around 100 or so writers who've contributed very, very generously to the book. So it's it's got so much in it. And I one thing I really liked about it, actually, is that it's not just one genre. It's not just literary novelists. It's not just journalists. It's not just you've got poets, you've got screenwriters, you know, you've got spe- a speech writer in there. And I, I really like that because I think sometimes you know, writing is something that we do with every day, we do in so many different contexts, and you've got people addressing it from all angles. Who do you imagine is the uh, is the average reader of this book? It's quite tricky. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a lot broader than a book which is really a technical guide to writing. There are some amazing books out there that do offer very, very step-by-step guidance, I suppose, on improving your writing, or indeed sort of just getting getting published. And I actually think this is definitely got lots of that stuff in it but I also think that you could read this even if you you aren't a writer and you don't particularly aspire to be one um, because a lot of the advice in it is really it's broader than that it's it's advice for leading a creative life and in some cases it's advice for dealing with success dealing with failure really dealing with life's ups and downs um, in a way that I think most people can relate to so if you like any of the many brilliant authors in the book um, then I think you can take something from it are there any particular snippets or, or tidbits that you could you could share with with the reader um, I know you particularly maybe things that are funny or things that you found particularly touching when when um, you and us were pulling it together Oh, so, there were so many. I mean, I, I really felt quite quite moved, particularly by writers' stories of their childhoods, because I think something um, that's really important is to remember that writers can come from any walk of life, and many of them did have these fantastic upbringings. Um, there's one he was, I think, reading 
I don't know how to pronounce this, a classical <laughs> classical writer, Livy, on the beach when he was a teenager. So you've got certainly got people who are, you know, really bookish from a really young age. Um, but you've also got these wonderful, best-selling, brilliant, award-winning writers who grew up without having books in their house necessarily and without having a lot of role models around them for writing. And I think it's really, really great to have that reminder. So I enjoyed that. On a very selfish level, um, one, of, one of my favourite bits of advice in the book comes from Marlon James, and it's really about how writers need to deal with feedback. Um, and in that, he, he really strongly kind of says, you know, you need to take, uh, take the feedback that you get and make the most of it and accept what you can, what you can learn from it. Um, even if, and I, I don't remember his exact wording, but it's, it's more or less saying, even if um, the person giving it to you is being a bit of an asshole. Um, so, and I, I take that uh, as really useful um, sort of advice because I think as an editor, there's always, uh, you know, this back and forth with an author where you're trying to figure out ways to work with them. And, you know, sometimes a bit of a, a question of, you know, how how can I phrase this? What's the best way to communicate with this author? am I the asshole? is something that sometimes crosses one's mind. And, and I think that his advice is something that for editors at least is, um, it's nice to hear. Definitely, we're not an asshole to work with. <laughs> the question that I'm sure actually listeners would like to know is what would we like to work with? Oh my gosh. Feel free um, to be honest, by the way. <laughs> no, no, really fun. I would say this is definitely one of the funnest projects I've done. Definitely sort of t- terrifyingly efficient at points. Like I, was sort of, I don't think you guys ever took longer than about 30 seconds to reply to an email, um, which, which sets quite a high precedent. Um, I think there was probably one point at which Simon was like snowed into a cabin or something and you ha- guys had to request like a one day extension <laughs> and I was like sure. I think it was, I think I think it was a week at first and that was yeah. that was completely on me that was that was not um Rachel Rachel's efficiency was um unparalleled as as usual I should say that that, that was almost yeah but that I mean that in the context of of editing uh, that that's not exactly the a kind of um you know a big a big ask I think so no it was really fun and I feel like from the beginning you guys had a vision I really loved it we came together and and we worked on it and I think yeah the things that you guys brought brought alongside because of course it's not only the interviews you guys also have brought in lots of ideas and references from kind of classical writers and you know kind of contextualized some of these contemporary writers and I think you've done that really beautifully too so it was just a lot of fun really. And just before we um we we move on from the book for the time being, if you if you imagine a sort of hypothetical British slightly dysfunctional large family, this sort of book obviously has gift potential. I mean, who who within that hypothetical family would you envisage giving it to in you know the broad span of of festive celebrations? I lo- I love this, Simon. I I love the the thoroughness with which you're thinking about this, um, and also having kind of met members of both of your families last week at the launch. I'm I'm particularly enjoying this question. <laughs> Um, I mean, clearly any member of such a family could could gain something from it. I don't know. Sometimes I I think that we can be a bit. Too... What do you think? What do you think the, the the minimum age of a possible reader is? Three. Oh, I, mean... I don't know. I guess I guess that you could probably be. Um, you could probably get something from it. Actually, do you know what? You could get something from it at any age, really. From being a teenager who's looking at their heroes and the writers they love. Um, and sort of reading about because quite a few of the writers also talk quite a lot about that adolescence it's such a formative time for people who go on to be you know creative but of course a lot of people don't actually come to writing until a lot later in life Um, they don't have time and I think it also is there's something about sort of intellectual maturity as well that we we don't always give enough credit to that somehow your ability to really assimilate a lot of information and, and reflect on it and then kind of produce something of value I mean that does get a lot better with age so I I don't think um I don't think this is a kind of book with a specific age limit on it did you just say three Simon like a, yeah a three year old well... could read this book as, as when we were doing the audiobook, I stumbled over quite a lot of sentences. So <laughs> I'm not sure that's true. Me as a 29 year old struggled to read it out loud. So I think all of which is to subtly plug the audiobook version, which is also available. Can I ask, am I right in, in thinking that you guys are both going to be giving this to your own children when they turn three? Is that your plan? Of course. Two, yeah. <laughs> two, I think, probably. <laughs> well, speaking of early interest in writing, Sarah, where did your interest in books come from? I wasn't a very bookish young child. I was actually an, a terribly poor reader, very, very bad, until I was about eight. Uh, I was the second to last kid in my class on the reading scheme, which was 
for anyone who hasn't had the pleasure, a kind of chunk of books that you had to, you know, you had to work your way through and they were all incredibly boring. And I just have a very vivid memory of being sort of seven or so and just slogging through this really, really boring book about, I don't know, little children doing something dull. And I could never pronounce the word the. I, every single time I saw it, I'd say to he, to he. And I remember just, I could not get, I couldn't get past this. And I was so frustrated. And I just thought, this is so dull. Why would anybody do this? I mean, obviously there are more interesting things like running around outside or drawing pictures or the other stuff I like doing. Um, so I think the first thing to say, because there, there are a lot of people in publishing who really did teach themselves to read age two or three and probably would be picking up a cup. You know, I remember vividly kind of when I started working in the industry and I just realised, wow, there were all these people who were like these amazing kind of genius kids who just, who were so, so bookish. And I don't, you don't actually have to have started out that way, um, although it can be brilliant. I think suddenly when I was eight, I um, picked up the Narnia series and suddenly here was a book which wasn't sort of dull as ditch water and I fell in love with that and then I sort of instantly graduated to reading adult books which was probably just because they were lying around and I'd pick them up and I remember reading something like The Horse Whisperer when I was like probably nine which is you know grown-up book and thinking oh yeah this is great it's got like horses um there was like a romance which I was fascinated by and so after that, I was really addicted and I spent, you know, like lots of um, people, I spent, you know, the next 10 years basically burying my head in books and trying to avoid reality as much as possible. And did you always want to work in publishing or editing or was kind of writing yourself or journalism? Is that of interest too? We saw that you worked on the student newspaper. Oh, did you? <laughs> How did you see that? LinkedIn. Oh, <laughs> we cover all sources on this podcast. We go, we go deep into the uh, into the backstory. I fear your investigative skills. The answer is no. I grew up. Um, my mum is a teacher. She's a special needs teacher, although she's now retired. And I, I definitely grew up with books in my house, but I didn't grow up knowing anyone who really worked for a business. Um, almost everybody around me worked in the public sector um, and did jobs like um, nursing or social work or teaching. And so weirdly, I just, it, the idea of working for a business, that that was the, something that you one did, didn't really occur to me. I sort of assumed I'd probably become a teacher, I guess. And then when I was at university doing English, I read this report. I was doing a course which was all about English as an international language. And I was writing an essay about translation and I read a report that was produced by Penn, which is an international charity promoting freedom of speech um, and does a lot of work, really good work supporting translation. And the report, this is a long time ago, uh, probably 20 years now, and the report said something about how um, the rate of translation from English into other languages was incredibly high, but the rate of translation from other languages into the English book landscape was really, really low. And for some reason, that really um, caught my attention. And I suddenly started thinking, oh, that's that's wrong, isn't it? We're not really we're not really hearing from these other countries. We're just sort of we're set, we're set on broadcast mode and we're not really receiving. So I think I got interested. But at the time, I think the only um, <laughs> the only impression I had of publishing was mainly from Bridget Jones's diary. Um, and I sort of had this Im image that it was an industry that was going to be full of like blonde women called Olivia, like handing out canapes at book launches. And it just, it really didn't seem like a very familiar world. And I kind of also was quite an sort of quite an earnest sort of um, young person. And I sort of thought, oh, well, I should be doing something to save the world. So I, d I, I don't know. I, it wasn't an obvious one. But when I graduated, which was during the financial crisis, I had to sort of have a serious talk with myself because there were very few opportunities for new graduates. And some of the other things that I developed an interest in and I thought might, I might do, they all required further money in training basically either to go and do some kind of conversion course to pay for a master's um potentially to get selected for a special kind of graduate scheme I mean everything I looked at was basically going to cost quite a lot of money and time which I felt I didn't didn't quite have whereas publishing even though people talk about it as a very competitive industry and it's true it can be there wasn't really actually much of a bar to entry. I just thought, I'm just going to write to lots of publishing houses and see if anybody wants to give me work experience. 
And I, I did that. I bought a, a book called How to Get a Job in Publishing and I read it. And then I made a spreadsheet with sort of 20 publishers and I wrote to all of them. Um, and one said yes to work experience. And after that, I got a paid internship. And after that, I got a job. So I was incredibly fortunate in that I got into the industry relatively quickly. Um, but that was that was how I did it. I saw that you did a postgraduate degree in digital humanities as well. What made you want to do that? And could you explain for listeners what it is and also how much things have changed since when you studied it then and, and the landscape now? So after I started working in publishing, my first role was as a publicist, um, which I loved and I found really interesting. And I was doing it in Australia. I ended up moving to Australia after I initially had that internship I should say in between there was a year where I was job hunting basically I worked uh, I worked for charity as a youth worker and I was just kind of sending out you know feeders and trying to find work so it all happened but it it didn't happen quite as fast as that Um, but after I had that publishing internship I moved to Australia and I got a job as a publicist for an independent publishing house and after I'd done that job for about three years I'd been thinking about coming back to the UK and there were various things that interested me And one of them was kind of looking at the intersection of digital technology and publishing at the time, going back around like between 10 and 15 years ago, ebooks were obviously fairly new on the scene and also things like Goodreads and kind of the general kind of bookish um, online ecosystem was really coming to the fore for the first time. So I was really intrigued by all of that. And I thought, okay, I'll go back to the UK and I'll um, enrol in studying this master's in something called digital humanities, which is essentially the academic study of the intersection between digital technology and arts and culture. And it looks at things like not just online publishing, but also the digitization of artifacts um, in museums. It has a big, a big intersection with information science as well, archiving, libraries, things like that. So I came back, but but in between sort of deciding I was going to do that and doing it, something really interesting happened, which is that my employer, which was an independent company headquartered in Melbourne called Scribe, um, run by this, you know, brilliant publisher called Henry Rosenblum, who'd been doing it for sort of 30 years or so. And Henry decided that he would actually really like to um, have a go opening a UK branch and kind of expanding the business and going from being an Australian company to a kind of UK and Commonwealth, so UK and Australia headquartered publisher. And it so happened I was, you know, already thinking of going back. And so it sort of started off with me coming back and, you know, doing a bit of study and helping launch this nascent branch of an independent publisher in the UK. But what rapidly became clear is that um, kind of doing that like one or two days a week and, you know, was not was not going to be enough. It was a really big job. There was loads of work to do. And having this previous relationship of having worked uh, for Henry and with Scribe for three years um, meant that I was sort of in the right position to really throw myself into um, the publishing. So after a year, I sort of I, I cut back on the study. I sort of dropped out. I just think I think I just took a postgraduate certificate in the end, which is um, not a very sort of high level qualification, but it meant that I could study a few of the subjects I was most interested in. And at that point, I kind of just went back into full time publishing. And just rolling back slightly, what had taken you to Australia and then what what was the kind of literary and publishing scene like there compared to the UK? We saw in particular that the purchase price of books is a lot higher because of parallel import laws. Yes. So the reason I moved to Australia is because I was in love with an Australian. Um, so it wasn't a strategic career move, uh, probably the opposite. I was really it was really fortunate and quite unexpected that I was actually able to get into the industry there. Um, I think the industry is really interesting. I think in lots of countries, like we're very spoiled in some respects in the UK um, because we have, you know, the English language is a huge, huge, huge market. It's also a global language. Copies of books that we, we print in the UK can be sold in many different countries in the world. And there's this sort of vitality and scope to the industry that actually in many countries is, you know, they don't have that basically. Um, and Australia is is an, considered an export territory for UK publishers, which is a very sensitive subject in a way because local publishers in Australia wish to publish books into their own market. But in the end, they're dealing with a relatively small population and an absolutely vast landmass, which creates a lot of expense around distribution. And it makes it quite difficult to sometimes to kind of do the sort of publishing there that we might do here. So it, it, it's a really different picture um, economically. 
I think the other thing to say about the cover prices of books in Australia, which look very, very high from the outside, is that it is a completely different economy. It's been in growth for a really, really long time. I haven't checked recently in like recent years, but when I was there, I think it had been in growth continuously for something like 20 years. And people's salaries and cost of living were, were calculated differently. And actually, I don't think that you can simply say, oh, uh, people make more money there. So, you know, it's all fine. I think books are, I'm sure books are sort of still proportionally very costly but I think it, it is just different and that that became a really fascinating thing to think about when we were starting to publish in the UK because actually looking at the kind of drilling down into the pricing of books and things in different economies becomes very important when you're trying to become an in- international publisher. And when you first joined Scribe in Australia what were the what was the work that you were doing there? I was hired as a publicist which is um it was a really um, bold uh, move on the part of my boss because I was quite new to Australian sort of culture. And, you know, the work of a publicist is in- deeply, you know, intertwined with the media and the kind of um, current affairs that are happening in a country. So I had to go through a real crash course of learning more about that culture. Um, I mean, I think it's worth sort of spelling out what publicists do within publishing. I don't, you haven't interviewed any publicists on this podcast have you no we tried to get one but but she wouldn't come on (laughs) (laughs) not wanting to publicize herself so perhaps so a publicist is generally someone who would get media coverage um for whatever they're promoting but a publicist working in publishing and particularly working on non-fiction titles would be kind of working in a way that i think is particularly collaborative with parts of the media and Generally, Scribe, which has a, is really strong in nonfiction um, in Australia, is, I think, one of the leading independent publishers of, of nonfiction and was very deeply, you know, intertwined with looking at, you know, they might publish books by politicians. They might publish books that are really, really topical subjects, huge media interest in those things. And so it becomes a lot about understanding what journalists want and how journalists think and also how you can make a contribution not only to the sales of the book but also to public discourse um, and public conversation uh, and I think that's particularly true for sort of those really current affairs books that might be you know breaking a story they might be investigating something um, and I've, I really really love that I, I think in Australia I was just kind of really learning how to do things like that I didn't I didn't need really big current affairs campaigns as much. I mean, I definitely learned how to pitch and how to find a story, which was really useful because I had some really interesting bosses who taught me a lot. But I could sort of see, ah, that's what you do. You read the book and then within the book, you find what is the story? What is the pitch that is really going to speak to different media outlets? And I remember vividly the first time I really felt I did that and it was a really exhilarating thing. It was a book which was about agricultural policy um it sounded a bit dry and it was something to do with the subsidizing of different crops and I was looking at this book and I was thinking like how am I going to get media coverage for this book um and then in the middle of it there was a, a little uh, chart that s- said um why is a why why a Big Mac is cheaper than a salad and it just showed how funding different crops and subsidising them impacted on the sales prices of different goods. And as soon as I read that, I thought, yeah, that's mental. Why is a burger cheaper than a salad? And that was the pitch. And I pitched that. That was the subject line of the email. And um, I had a fantastic response. And I remember just thinking, like, that was the first time I was like, yes, I found the story. Just moving forward now to to your time at Scribe and and some of these books that you mentioned um, you were actually talking about. Could you tell us about Gut by Julia Enders? So this this book, which was acquired before the publisher had read any of it in English, but then became became a big success. So. Yeah. So um, so if you sort of fast forward to about a year into the Scribe UK experiment, things were like you know reasonably tough. In the you know starting a new branch of a business um, is always hard. Uh, it was a very steep learning curve, and I learned a lot. Uh, but we still hadn't really, you know, we were starting to get a bit more traction. The books were starting to get a bit more space, but we were still, I still felt like we weren't quite, you know, hadn't broken through yet. And Henry Rosenblum came back from Frankfurt Book Fair and he said, well, I've bought this book and um, I haven't read any of it yet. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it sounds really interesting. It's a, it's a, bit, it's a bit quirky. And we were sort of thinking like, mm, mm, and it was a book, it was a huge bestseller in Germany and it was all about the intestine. And it had these, it was by a young scientist and it had all these like 
hand drawn pictures of little like kind of cute cartoons about the guts. Um, and it was it was its direct translation of its title was Charming Bowels. Um, Poetic. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, what a title. And I just remember thinking, well, this is either going to be, you know, a surprise hit or um, a bit of a disaster, but we'll, we'll go for it. So we put the book on the list and uh, we changed the title to just Gut. Uh, the author, Julia Enders, had obviously been a sensation in, in Germany, but it's very common that books would be, you know, very popular in their home country and definitely not land internationally. So we didn't really know what would happen. And I, I sort of started the campaign for the book and it was very difficult to get any interest whatsoever. Um, most journalists, or weirdly enough, just didn't see the potential in this strange German book about the gut. Um, but I did feel that there was a story in there. It was a really interesting book. It was written in a very quirky, approachable and fun voice, but it was actually um, really explaining a lot of sort of cutting edge, breaking research into the importance of the microbiome, the vagus nerve, stuff that's become relatively well known since then. And if you look at, you know, the, pro the whole probiotics industry that sprung up in the intervening decades, you know, you can see this has really reached the mainstream. But at that point, it hadn't. And I think Julia was bringing it to a mass audience in pretty much kind of the first time, I guess. Um, so I did think there was something to say, but how to pitch that was really hard. Anyway, in the end, there was, I think we had about 300 pre-orders for the book, uh, which is not a lot. The book was published, you know, we sent out 300 copies and I just thought I have to keep going with this. And I was pitching and pitching and pitching. And there was one journalist who I was talking to and she said, oh, I think this is really, really interesting. And I kept, I kept that conversation going and going. And in the end, she did an interview. And the headline of the interview was um, pooing, why you're doing it wrong. And I think it was shared hundreds of thousand times of, of times on the Guardian um, websites. And it really went viral. And it was just it really, really spoke to people. <laughs> so many people were having, you know, problems with IBS and things like that. And this Really, this interview, which is a really good interview. The journalist is Annalisa Barbieri, fantastic journalist who writes very regularly for The Guardian. And she just absolutely nailed the story. She found the story. I can't say that was, you know, my, my pitch. She found that headline or, or her editor did. And um, it really, really spoke to people. And after that, it absolutely took off in a big way. Waterstones made it a book of the month. Um, I mean, I think it's probably sold in English at least a quarter of a million copies. It really was an exciting kind of sense of what might be possible. This is obviously an example of press coverage making a, a huge difference to a book's success and to sales. But is it an anomaly? I mean, how much does uh, how much of a difference does reviewing make to, to a book's impact? It's a really good question. I mean, first of all, press coverage is not, it's not just reviews. Reviews are quite a specific type of coverage. And sometimes they're not, they're not the best coverage for a book, um, even if they're good reviews. Some reviews would sell sell more copies and others don't and it's not always just about um how much praise there is in the review i think it's about finding what's right for every book and i always felt when i was kind of running campaigns which i haven't done for a while i should say so it's it's not you know maybe i'm not the most cutting edge but um i always felt that every book had these very specific sort of five or six things that were right for that book whatever it was like the one outlet that could run a review that was perfect for its audience the one interview that was just right the one bit of marketing the one this or that and actually it's a really broad mix and I think people who are really expert in this field are really good at identifying what's worth it because you know just throwing money at a book is also not going to work I know I know you know people love to see their book cover um in an ad on the tube but if you just if we all just went around splashing money on on tube ads without it being absolutely the right book uh, marketed in the right way in tandem with the right kind of press coverage and the right retail support you just be wasting everyone's time and money so I, th I think it's it is identifying those things um, I would say probably the most effective things for in my experience for selling certain sort of non-fiction books can be if you have an interview like the gut interview or an opinion piece that just absolutely lands with people and you've got a headline on it and you've got an, a really clear pitch. I think there was a, a piece that we published a book by an international writer, which was about capitalism and I think psychoanalysis or something. And it was actually quite, 
quite difficult to find the story. But the, in the end, the pitch really was why capitalism is turning us into psychopaths. <laughs> and that really, really resonated. And again, you know, that opinion piece went viral. We sold out our print run. This is, again, it's going back a little way. So things might have, have changed a bit. But I think um, you need to find what speaks to people. And the media were trying to do that too. And the best campaigns are the publisher, um, you know, the publicist working very very much in tandem with the with the journalists to find what speaks to their audience. We are thrilled to announce the publication of Always Take Notes, advice from some of the world's greatest writers. The book, edited by the two of us, features contributions from almost 100 past guests on the podcast. It's a distillation of the wit and wisdom we've heard over the past six years. The book offers, we think, frank and entertaining guidance on writing in particular and living a creative life in general. It answers questions such as, where do the best ideas come from? How do you stay motivated? What does it take to become a published author? And how do you actually make money from your writing? Published by Ithaca Press, Always Take Notes, advice from some of the world's greatest writers is available now in all good bookshops. We hope you enjoy reading it. Could you tell us now a bit about Billion Dollar Whale, a very different project, but this this story of the uh, Malaysian 1MDB heist and then this book that had a, a complicated publication history. So how did you get involved in that and how did that develop? So it started out with a, a best-selling American book about um, really the world's biggest financial fraud at the time, at least, um, which I think was about six years ago, seven years ago. And it was the one on DV fraud. It was a, a Malaysian man who had um, defrauded, you know, seven billion dollars or so from from the government. And when the book came out, was was coming out, I guess, in the states. Um, it hadn't been picked up in the UK. Um, and um, I actually, if I'm honest, I'm slightly struggling to remember who initially heard about this and brought this to the scribe. But I think it was probably Henry, um, and he decided to, to publish it. And we sort of came on board and there was this backstory which was that the subject of the book despite being a known uh sort of fugitive at the time and and being on the run essentially from interpol and i believe the cia was somehow sending uh, a law a law had contracted a law firm to send letters to people who were selling the book telling them he was going to sue them um, now, the two authors, Bradley Hope and uh, Tom Wright, who are fantastic investigative journalists, um, had kind of been dealing with this all the way along. They'd Throughout their investigation, they'd faced, you know, all kinds of uh, this sort of thing. Um, and basically, we started to be on the receiving end of this. Um, and by this time, uh, Scribe UK had grown a bit. We had a bit more of a team. Uh, we had a UK publisher. I think at the time, I, my job title was, was managing director for the UK. So I was sort of responsible uh, for a lot of the kind of day-to-day -day running of the business and this was one of those things that came to me and I started you know we, we talked about what to do and got a lawyer on board uh, and we got some really helpful advice from Alex Wade of Reviews and Cleared um, and he helped to sort of draft responses to these letters but what I discovered was that even though we had been advised that these letters were um, something that we shouldn't be worried about that that we're not going to be acted on um, and for various reasons, you know, that we shouldn't give in to this form of intimidation. Um, it, it, if I sort of tried writing myself back to this law firm and saying, you know, leave us alone, um, it just sort of provoked them more. And then they'd send more letters and the letters would get more aggressive. And, um, and it, you know, they're all coming straight to my inbox. So I can't every day open it and there'd be like another sort of more increasingly menacing and threatening and kind of over the top, sort of slightly cartoon villainy kind of missive. And it was only really when when we got that sort of legal advice and we got kind of a better response together and sent that off uh, and started to have that legal support that we could push back more effectively. In the end, the book came out. It did incredibly well. Um, there was no legal threats. And in the meantime, we were able to re reassure booksellers as well that they could sell this book. Uh, indeed, they should sell this book because it was a really popular book and brilliantly done. And also that we, you know, we really wanted to stand up to this form of intimidation. Ultimately, this book was all about it you know, exposing malfeasance and abuse of power at a very high level. Um, and so sort of backing down and giving into that felt 
you know, really wrong, I think. And just to clarify that the novelty here was that the intimidation, I mean, you were receiving it, but it was also being directed directly at booksellers. Yeah. And in a way that made it a bit easier for me, because actually, if you're just on the receiving end of that kind of thing, it's, uh, you know, it's not very nice. But seeing it sort of happening to these, you know, booksellers who had no recourse to legal advice, and are really just trying to get on with the like very challenging job of, of bookselling. Um, it really made me indignant. And I thought this is so wrong. You know, this is it's this just shouldn't shouldn't be happening. Did you find it stressful, that whole process, or were you confident that you would prevail in it? I found it stressful. You know, that's the honest answer. I did find it stressful. I think something that's difficult to um, get my head around working in publishing really is that um, there's no sort of handbook that one can consult in these moments. You know, you can't ever look and just see, oh, what does it say? Should I, you know, how do you respond to this situation? Um, And actually, you can, of course, you can seek advice, but that can also be very, very costly. Um, So making those kinds of judgments, I think what it helped teach me was how being a publisher in so many ways is about training your judgment, um, training yourself to be judicious, to make good decisions in areas where there's a lot of grey area. And ultimately, that is the nature of kind of producing culture. That's the nature of producing knowledge. It's not a straightforward step where you can just follow, you know, the the numbers and kind of come out with, you know, this is the perfect way to publish a book. And publishers can be wrong as well. They can they can make decisions they shouldn't make or they can do things, publish books. And then five years later, it's like, well, we don't really use that terminology anymore. Or actually, you know, that wasn't the right call to make at the time. So it's it's a very, very dynamic process. And I think learning on the one hand, to have a bit of confidence, um, but also to have a bit of humility. And that's the equilibrium that we're trying to strike. We should say as well that Sarah then um, later published my book on the army, but um, I did a whole episode on that. So listeners can can listen to, to me talk about that um, ad um, infinitum. But we wanted to ask a bit about the kind of general business model of publishing. Like I think this is something that both aspirant and practicing writers are, are kind of fascinated about, but particularly, um, you know, as an editor, you you get like a PL statement at the end of every year, right? And then the other thing was that what sort of fraction of the books that, that you publish account for the profit? And is there any way of predicting that or not? Basically, just the kind of as how it works as a business, I think our listeners would be really fascinated to to hear. Um, absolutely. I mean, I think it varies quite a lot business to business. I mean, when I was at Scribe, um, the way that we would look at those numbers would be more informal um, and we wouldn't necessarily be looking at them all the time. And I'm now in a much bigger publisher. I'm working for Bonnier Books UK. It's the seventh biggest publisher in the UK um, and it's more formalised. Um, but I don't think the kind of underlying you know, tectonics of how people are making money are any different, really. So, I would I would say, you know, now I am looking quite carefully at the economics on a very, you know, granular book by book level. And so uh, both before publishing the book, when I'm making an offer, I'll be doing lots of calculations in my spreadsheet. Um, and that's informing the conversation I have with our finance department and, you know, how I would offer for a book, of course. Um, But then after publication, there's a process of review and you're coming back and you're looking at it, you're thinking, you know, was that right? Did we sell those copies? Um, You know, did we sell them in those formats at those times? Was it the right price? Was it, you know, why? If we didn't, why not? If it outperformed, you know, why? I think it's very important. But I also think there's a, again, I'm talking a lot about equilibrium. There's again a balance to strike. And if one is too much in in the weeds and looking at things in that very abstract financialized way you don't always really know you don't actually really always know why a book worked or didn't work you can you can guess um and if you extrapolate too much then you just look at the books that succeed look at their profit and loss statement and say right we're gonna we're gonna just um you know basically photocopy that and we're just going to do it again and again and again and again and of course that can work to a point um but it it sort of stops working and you need to find something new and and take risks too so balancing those things is is really the job of the publisher and kind of having a good mix in the types of books you're publishing across the business or potentially on your own list is one of the ways people mitigate that kind of instability and the difficulties that we have with predicting um, the sales performance of books. So if you're publishing into in a few different ways across a few different genres, um, then of course you're sort of spreading your bets a little bit better, um, but you then don't want to go too broad because then you're going to go into parts of the market that you don't really know, you might not be able to publish very well in. 
And is it the case, therefore, that there's a few massive books that sort of subsidise and bankroll the ones sort of lower down? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my my I don't know because I haven't fact checked this, but I have definitely seen it bandied about that something like 80 percent of books are not profitable and sort of 20 percent of them are. I don't. I saw a stat that it's I think 15 percent of books sell fewer than 12 copies, which is quite a astounding fact if it's true. I mean, I, I would say that statistic sounds like it's talking about book scan, which is the kind of formal book charts. And there's a lot of sales that are not necessarily accounted for that, particularly if they happen overseas or in, in markets that are not like tracked that well through retailers that are not tracked that well. So I think that sounds particularly bad, but I, I think there's something around that, that there are a lot of books that don't, they don't ultimately find their market. And so publishers, I know, I mean, I know that publishers have got many downsides and there are lots of justified criticisms one can make of the industry. But I also do think it's worth remembering that ultimately publishers essentially are subsidising a vast number of books on which they lose money and they're still publishing them and they're still really trying their very best to do them. Um, So, yeah, the sort of one doesn't want to be too conservative in what one publishes. um, But sometimes I see people sort of who seem to feel like publishers are really, really, you know, not not kind of taking any risks at all. And it's and it's not the case, I think. On the acquisition side as well, do you and both yourself and other editors generally, does it work that you have like a, a set budget and you have to stay within that over a period of time? Or do you is there sort of more flexibility that if there's a particular project you can then make a case internally for, for more of that? Like do do you know at the beginning of the year what your resources are and you have to stay within that or is it more of a, a negotiation I don't I don't know what it's like for different people in different places I think a, a question the answer to a question like that is always going to depend on your le- the levels of capital that are really available to the bi- the business and how liquid that capital is so I think you you're going to be able to have access to a bigger pool of money in some cases so you might be able to sort of play around with that more and kind of sort of you might not need to have a budget in mind in terms of your spending but you might then have a very very high revenue target um, and quite a high profit target or you might be going on a slightly more sort of fiscally conservative model and you might sort of be looking okay well we, we can't really have outgoings per month of more than xyz so actually if i acquire this book for a huge sum now uh you know we're gonna have to start paying the advance and then it's going to really impact on like how much money you've got available later so again it just depends a lot on the business I think obviously an independent company uh, or a smaller company will be sort of financed in different ways to a bigger one but the push for kind of uh, revenue and profit growth is is something everybody feels particularly in a time like now in which there's a lot of inflation and people are obviously very mindful of that. Could we talk now about your move to Bonnier, which you alluded to just now, and setting up Ithaca in 2022? Um, How did that come about and why did the opportunity appeal? Well, I I just had had such an amazing experience of working with Scribe and I had loved it and I'd done so many different roles within the business. (laughs) I was there for 12 years um, and... I felt like I'd just learned an incredible amount and at various points I'd done, you know, I'd sold rights, um, I'd done publicity, marketing and sales, um, I'd begun acquiring, I, you know, I'd started editing um, and I'd learned so much from a lot of colleagues, um, particularly uh, Philip Gwynne Jones, who was our UK publisher, um, and from Henry, obviously, and others. So I, I loved it um, and we built like a really nice team Um but I was also still only in my 30s and felt like um, staying there for the rest of my career would, would was probably not right. So I was sort of in this blind where I was like, well, I love this so much, I don't want to leave. And yet I probably should. And into that um, dilemma um, came Piminda Mann, a very dynamic um, CEO of Bonnier Books UK, who I think you've already interviewed. Um, and I had met her because I'd begun going to these um, meetings that the Publishers Association was running. It was during COVID. We joined the Publishers Association and I was going to these meetings. And the main thing I was going to these meetings with other sort of basically senior people in other publishing houses the main reason I was going was really because it was a time of like huge, huge, huge instability, massive challenges in terms of managing a business. And so I was really just like 
any input, any any anyone who can kind of share knowledge, um, I want to be there. So I was turning up to these meetings. And the thing that's really nice is that in the end, even if you're working in a very small business, such as I was, or if you're running, you know, if you're like David Shelley or, you know, one, running one of the big four, you know, everybody would be in the same little meeting essentially and I suppose yeah that's that's how Paminda met me and I felt I was coming to these meetings and asking a lot of questions probably sounding like I didn't know anything um and and yet I think she just felt that I was quite quite curious and maybe that was good uh, and so that was the start of the conversation. You alluded to some of it there but what is what is different about working in a in a much bigger organisation and, and then also what is the same? So I've been at Bonnier for 18 months um I've been launching a new imprint called Ithaca Press um, and it's been a really wonderful journey. I still think, I think I'm still figuring out the answer to that question, Simon. Like I'm still figuring out what's the same and what's different. Um, I guess there's a lot more structure and part of me loves that. Like I, I think, um, you know, having these reviews where we're looking at the finances and the PL and like the system where I can kind of at the press of a button really look at the performance of all of my books. That actually is something that I really like. And at Scribe, we, we could do that, but it was like more manual and it, you know, didn't didn't focus on it. So some of that sort of access to information is really good. Um I think being part of a bigger organization is always is always a different experience. Like I think being in a in a in a smaller pond, you know, your ability to influence things is greater. So you you but you're also having um, huge responsibility and sometimes responsibility over areas that you're really not that expert in. Um, whereas going to a bigger company, you've got access to people who know so much about so many different things. So for me, it's been a really exciting kind of learning opportunity, to be honest. And what's your vision um, for the Ithaca list going forward? So essentially, it's a sort of literary, relatively upmarket imprint. Um, I tend to focus quite a lot on narrative nonfiction. That's sort of something I'm really passionate about. So history, reportage, maybe literary memoir. Another thing to mention is translation. So I love translation. Um, it goes all the way back to the the pen report that I read when I was a teenager. And there's quite a lot of translation on the list already. Um, so far, only nonfiction. But I think I'm beginning to look at um, doing some fiction in translation as well. So at the moment, that's that's where where the imprint is headed. And what's it like interacting with agents and authors and stuff when you're setting up a new imprint from scratch? Obviously, Bonnier is a very established outfit but but Ithaca is is your creation what are those conversations like um really varied I mean Bonnier something that's fascinating about Bonnier is it's seen as a real newcomer in the UK landscape um and it's true that I don't think it's been active in the UK for much more than a decade even though it's now really you know the seventh biggest publisher in the UK and just doing you know really well I think that people still think of it as like the new kid on the block um but it's actually 200 years old it has this amazing sort of storied legacy um it's originally a Scandinavian company and it just had this history of publishing um you know very successfully for literally centuries um and in Sweden they the same group kind of owns newspapers and other other kind of media concerns so I think it's a mix of kind of being I, I'm very familiar with that experience of being kind of new and coming to people and not really having a brand to stand on. And that was the case at Scribe. Scribe is an incredibly respected publisher in Australia, but nobody knew who we were, we were in the UK. And so I really had to, during that you know decade in which I was building up Scribe UK, I had to learn how to present myself and what I do in a way that didn't really fall back on this illustrious legacy and the the glamour of the brand and the glamour of the imprint and I wouldn't I was never able to use that um and and to some extent that's still the case at Bonnier people do recognize particularly their incredible commercial success um but there's lots of people lots of writers and agents who are not so familiar with with Bonnier so I think in a way that's kind of what I wanted and and when I was looking at when I was at Scribe when I imagine going to a really um, historic imprint and a much bigger publisher and sort of trying to fit myself into that um, I felt a sort of resistance inside myself of like well but would I be you know there's all these brilliant imprints publishing these literary you know books um, usually named after like dead white men um, and I was like but would I really be a representative of that would I really be 
fitting in with that or not and um I wasn't sure and I guess the opportunity to start something new was really uh compelling having said that I've certainly been in conversations this year with authors who get where we get really close to having you know having a deal and they're really keen and we've got a really great vision for the book and everything's really great and then at the last minute there's just a bit of like oh but then again there's another editor who's interested in that imprint it's like it's a bit more of a household name and there's for some writers that's that's the right choice and they want to go to that brand I've had the opposite of as well I've had people who've been published by really really big existing imprints and they're a bit they're looking for something different and the idea of coming to a new imprint where you can have a bit more of a a bit more attention frankly and you're not really competing against lots and lots and lots of other people who are publishing what you publish is a huge attraction could we now talk about the third title that you sent over, um, A Small Southern Town by Andrew Harding? How did that project come about? Was it one that was pitched to you or did you go to him for that? This is one of my favourite projects that I've done this year. Obviously, your project is my number one. Um, but the the book came out in July and it's a, it's a very short book. It's 160 pages. It's a work of, sort of really immersive... Uh, reportage you know very sort of strong storytelling and it's essentially a picture of the war in Ukraine in microcosm um it's told over just a few days at the very beginning of the invasion and from the viewpoints of around sort of five or six key people in a small town in Ukraine as they realize that the Russians are on their doorstep and they have to come up with a strategy to defend the town and the remarkable thing is that they succeeded and they defeated the Russians they couldn't take the town and as a result it really changed the course of the war so the, the backstory to this is that BBC correspondent um, Andrew Harding had been sent to report on this town and his report had um, been viewed something like five million times online. It was, a, it was a, obviously a story people were fascinated by. And he, he was too. And he went back and he, he decided to spend more time there and try and figure out how, how did they do this? How did these pensioners and farmers and people with no military experience help to you know create this strategy that had been so successful and what he sort of found was that it was really because all of all of the history of of the Ukraine and Russia and all of the kind of backstory had played out within this this kind of confrontation um and he met some amazing characters who told them his stories and that's the basis of the book so the book was pitched to me I think around December last year by an agent called Rebecca Carter, wonderful agent I'd worked with before. And at the time, it was a very different pitch. So so I didn't initiate this project, um, but it, it, we sort of had a, um, a kind of back and forth that really was about sort of reshaping and positioning it, which is something that um, happens quite a lot and can often be really, really enjoyable. And what, when it was pitched to me, it was quite a long book and it was going to take quite a long time to write the book. Um, and it was going to use this story, but it was also going to have a, a lot of kind of historic scope. And Andrew was reporting from Russia, or I guess the wider course of the former USSR during the 90s. So he had a lot of backstory to bring. Um, and when it was pitched to me, I thought, you know, this is happening now and people need stories now that help explain this complex con conflict. And so I kind of made a counter proposal essentially to Rebecca and Andrew and said, look, this great big book you want to do sounds brilliant, but we don't, we don't really have time. I think we need to do something soon in that. And also this story is a standalone. This is an amazing, amazing story. And Andrew's writing is so brilliant and so vivid. Um, why don't we just use this story? And through through that, you can tell the whole, the, the wider context, but you're just using this story as a, a way to do that. He was very enthusiastic. Uh, we got that deal done really fast, which is really helpful. Um, I think he had to deliver within something like two months. He'd already done a lot of the research. He'd spent like weeks and weeks in this town collecting all the stories and he was going back and forth uh, to do the rest. And I think he delivered in maybe January and then I edited it in February and then we, we and there we go. And it was just brilliant. I was so pleased with how that book came out. And when it did come out in the summer, um, it really, really resonated with readers and it got some wonderful reviews. And I think there's a lot of people who've seen it as a sort of uh, a microcosm, something that explains the war in microcosm in a way that's very accessible and really puts them there uh, and I think that's something really exciting that good nonfiction can do. So we're coming up against our time limit now, but just returning to the, the podcast book now, um, can we talk about the editing of that, both, you know, how that works between yourself and myself and Rachel, but also we have a chapter in the book, which is 
on the very subject of editing, which I know is something close to your heart. So, you know, that that whole piece, could we unpick that a bit? Well, I, I was really curious to see what it would be like editing a book, which has got a whole chapter on editing in it. Um, I, and I felt sort of a bit exposed reading it. I remember sort of crossing out a sentence which had something about Gordon Lish and, and his violent interventions where he kind of, I think you used the phrase carving up Carver because he just absolutely, you know, decimated Ray McCarver's stories as part of his editorial process, for better or worse. And I, I had this like moment of intense self-consciousness when I was kind of crossing something out and writing a comment where I sort of thought, am I am I am I being lish here? You know, like is is this should I should I leave this sentence or not? So I think there's something about editing a book, which is about the mechanics of writing in the way yours is, which is quite interesting and made me reflect a lot on the work of editing, which I love, but which is also um, not always completely clear cut. I think there's sometimes an image of editors as though they're these sort of almost like godlike figures who have a sort of objective approach that they're taking and they're going to sort of correct the manuscript and get rid of any infelicities and that's there's a sort of template that they can apply um and obviously I came to editing relatively late in the sense that it wasn't my my route up as it were I kind of moved across um and went kind of from being more on the commercial side to getting more and more involved in editorial um and I've definitely loved that process but I think it's made me aware that it's both kind of, on the one hand, uh, a really sort of, you, 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 it's, it can be quite a kind of tyrannical role where you're coming in and you're looking at somebody's words that they've carefully crafted and you're literally just kind of hacking them out. And sometimes I have this like emo- wave of emotion where I read something and I think, well, that's just completely wrong. Why have you done that? And I get this kind of like sort of sense of slight sort of frustration. Um, but on the other hand, you need, you need to be very humble. It's not your book. It's not your voice. Um, and, you know, you can't impose yourself too much. And that's a really, really interesting, again, the equilibrium, and you know, metaphor is again an equilibrium and every book is different and every editorial relationship is different. So learning that and realising that I'm not, there's no objective, perfect editorial approach and that I have to kind of learn and implement. It probably took me a few years. And since then, it's been uh yeah about more about relational it's a very relational role and in our case i really enjoyed that relationship and i hope you guys did too very much so maybe either referring to the book or not um what advice would you give to people who are starting out who maybe want to write a book and pitch it to you at ithaca um what do you think people should bear in mind i think sometimes um Working on one's style and giving oneself space to do that um, outside of a particular project or a particular kind of subject is is a bit undervalued. And there are some writers, particularly because I work in nonfiction, which is often, um, it, it basically breaks down into either journalists and people who are kind of trained writers who turn their hands to a specific subject or um, experts who don't usually write for a general audience and who are now attempting to do so. Um, and the, the first category, usually, you know, their writing is generally really great. Um, uh, maybe stretching out over book length takes some work in terms of structure. Uh, but line by line, you know, they've got all this fantastic experience like you guys. Um, but then I think the other category of person, somebody who is not themselves a professional writer per se, but who's writing a book for general audience, there's there's huge, huge potential to work on your writing and people, the myth of talent and the idea that we're all just born innately able to write well um, can hold people back. And so sometimes the conversations I have with people, particularly academics or other kinds of subject experts is, you know, work, develop your writing and develop your voice and do that really freely. Don't think about, you know, don't think about who's going to read it. Don't think about the subject. Go and do an Arvon course, um, pitch articles, think a bit about how you might write a piece. If you were writing this for um, a really general audience on uh, a newspaper or wherever, how would you write it? How would you write if you had no constraints? You hadn't been trained to write in a, in a technical way for a particular audience, whether that's a legal jargon or academic jargon. Um, free yourself basically and write write whatever you want in the way you want whether it's memoir or fiction or whatever and then come back and you know bring that freedom to the treatment you're taking with this serious factual subject 
Great. Well, look, thank you very much indeed, Sarah, and um, wishing you all the best with all of your projects and, of course, with our book as well, which we hope everyone will, will go and buy. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. It's been a huge pleasure. That was the Always Take Notes interview with Sarah Braybrook. You can find her on Twitter at SR Braybrook and Ithaca's website is www.bonniabooks.co.uk forward slash imprints forward slash Ithaca. Hello, it's us again. Simon, what was your takeaway from the interview with Sarah? Well, obviously it was um, a huge piece of self-promotion for us because Sarah um, is our publisher for the Always Take Notes book. So a bit of a different episode, but it was also excellent to have it on. And um, as I alluded to on air uh, in, during the interview, Sarah is someone who's very important to me and that she, um, I think rescued is probably the right word, my um, my book on the army and, and published it when it didn't look like it would find its way into the world. And I think that's something that I will um, I will literally never forget um that she did uh so she's someone i feel i have a kind of really close bond with from that and obviously we've both worked with her very closely on this i think it's just great interesting publishers right you know because we get to ask them about all these questions that writers are really keen to to ask about and um you don't don't always get to hear and i'm kind of very interested in that that line between the the creative and the commercial and and the business and the editorial and how how all of that works and then i think also what she was good on was about moving from an independent uh to a more corporate publisher which is you know a, a kind of time-honored route something that david shelley did what about you yeah really agreed i love speaking to sarah because i know you've obviously worked with her in the past as you say um but i haven't and so i didn't really know anything about her career path before Bonnier, so it was great to learn about that. Um, I think we've both found that she's been tremendously efficient and a huge champion of the podcast and the book. So yeah, it was great to have her on the show as an important part of the Always Take Notes story now. Ecosystem. I think franchise. Well, universe. <laughs> franchise. Multiverse, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Juggernaut, maybe we should. Certainly. Yeah, well, as, we, as we've just seen on the Ithaca website, we are described as a hit podcast. So, you know, we'll take that. It, it must be true. What have uh, you been up to, Rachel, and what culture have you been consuming? I am currently reading Naomi Alderman's new book called The Future. I really liked her last one called The Power, so I'm enjoying getting stuck into that. And in terms of my cultural diet, it's London Film Festival at the minute, or it'll have just to finish when this goes out. So I've been watching films there, um, Emerald Fennell's new film called Saltburn, which I enjoyed. And then I'm watching a couple of others, one called Faux with Paul Meskel and Saoirse Ronan and Poor Things, which is Yorgos Lanthimos's new film. Um, so yeah, uh, a nice sort of, I've not been to the cinema in ages, so it's, uh, it's nice to have a reason to go frequently. How about you? Where are the showings? Uh, mostly at Picture House Central um, okay. in Piccadilly. So Very nice. Yeah, mostly there. Um, and that Naomi Alderman's previous book was the one about um, women who can electrocute men. Is that right? That is correct, yeah. That's, that sounds well up your street, Rachel. It is. And it was turned into a TV show, which I actually need to watch. Um, Excellent. So, yeah. In my cultural diet, um, I was looking this up before we came on air, I read a very powerful magazine piece in The New Yorker by a woman called Margaret Talbot. Um, which is about a, a really horrific story, actually, about um, a woman who was abused in a children's home in Austria in, I think, the 70s, uh, and then eventually went back with Margaret to kind of piece this together. And it's all about this sort of horrendous kind of child custody practices that went on and were deeply rooted in, in Nazism. Um, it's not it's not an easy read, but it's, it's very powerful, and I would recommend that. And I also read um, a Guardian long read by... Samantha Submarinian, who is, of course, a past Always Take Notes guest, but it was his profile of Michael Lewis um, related to Michael Lewis's new book about um, Sam Bankman Freed and the whole crypto case. And it is really interesting. I thought it was in some ways the most astute thing that I'd, I'd kind of read in the coverage because his point being that, that Michael Lewis is the kind of master of these sort of upbeat stories about, you know, slightly offbeat people beating or, or gaming or mastering the system. And it looked like Sam Bankman Fried was doing that kind of up to the point that uh, he got indicted. Uh, I've also finished a book by Simon Thompson called Unjustifiable Risk, The Story of British Climbing. Uh, and I tracked down in the British Library today a book uh, by Marcel Kurtz, who was a, a Swiss ski mountaineer called Alpinisme Ivanal, which I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into. Anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Aikam. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. Our score is by Jess Danheiser, and our graphic design is by James Edgar. If you'd like to follow us 
us on social media. We're on Twitter at Take Notes Always, on Instagram at Always Take Notes. If you'd like to support us on our crowdfunding page on Patreon, you can find us on there under Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes or get in touch with us via our website, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye.